and with that, I think we can get into our first talk, which is going to be Veronica on Diffie Helmet. As Steven said, um, hi, my name is Veronica, and today I'm going to be talking about the Diffie Hellman Key Exchange. Um, in this talk, I'm just going to go over who am I, um, what is the Diffie Hellman Key Exchange, how does it work, uh, why isn't it perfect, and how, how is it relevant. So, one more time, I'm Veronica. <laughs> um, I saw someone else has the name Veronica. Nice name, I like it. Um, I am the vice president of White Hat. I am a fourth year computer science major from the Bay Area. And during this quarantine, I've been doing a lot of karaoke and a lot of video games. Um, so now that we're best friends, what what is a Diffie-Hellman key exchange? Um, I don't expect any of you guys to already know this. Uh, and if you do, that's, that's awesome. Like, good on you to already know it. But for those of you who don't, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is a method of key exchange uh, that allows entities to communicate securely by creating a shared key through the combination of public and private variables. So this is what it looks like um, in an overall big mathy way, uh, but this looks a little intimidating, so I'm going to break it down a bit more for you guys. So let's say we have Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob are classmates, and they want to pass a note to each other during class. They could just pass um, this in plain text, just write out SUP uh, and pass it through the network of classmates to each other. But what if Alice wanted to tell Bob a secret? You can't just trust your classmates not to peek at the message. Um, so Alice and Bob might want to encrypt this message so that only they will be able to understand it. Um, now, let's say that Alice and Bob both know the perfect generic encryption. Uh, they will want to use a shared key for this encryption, or if it is a, an encryption that requires a shared key, then they're going to have to find a way to share this shared secret key. However, they don't currently have a way to do this. For example, if Bob were to just say like, hey, let's use seven as our secret key, then someone along this network of classmates could just look at that paper, say, oh, look, their key is going to be seven, and then use this to decipher whatever secrets they were trying to pass to each other. So this is when you'd want to use the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. How does it work though? Like, how does this Diffie-Hellman thing work? Um, well, both Alice and Bob will agree to two public variables, P and G, where P is going to be a really big prime number and G is something called a generator, generator which is often a small prime number. Um, notice for this example, P is 23. That is not a large prime number. But this is just for the sake of being able to see how the math works without having to do a bunch of big calculations um, and have a bunch of numbers on the screen. So next, Alice and Bob will want to come up with their own secret variables. We'll call this little a and little b. Alice and Bob's secret variables will never cross the unsecured channel. This is only for them. Um, only they will know it. Bob will never know Alice's secret key. Alice will never know Bob's secret key. It's just those are theirs only. Now, since they shared that P and G at the beginning and they have their own secret variable, they can combine those using this formula. Um, for Alice, big A equals G to the power of little a mod P. Um, well, mod, if you don't remember what that is, it's, it's basically the remainder uh, in division. So when you plug that in, it's just some plug and chug, and then you get big A and big B. So far, are people kind of following this? Like, the math makes sense. OK, there are numbers there. They exchanged some keys. They held on to their own. Good. OK, cool. I'm seeing some nodding. Um, well, now that those numbers are combined and you have big A and big B, these combined variables can cross through the unsecured network. Um, so they can do this because big A and big B are really difficult to derive based off that formula. I'll just go back to show it again. So even if you have big A and big B and P and G, it's really difficult to get little a and little b. That's really important. Um, so now that they have now that they have each other's combined variables, they can combine that with their own private keys now and wind up with the same secret key. Notice this is the same formula again. And yet when you plug in your own secret key with the combination of their secret key and those public variables, it's the same thing. 
whoa, <laughs> this is just math being really cool and being super useful in security. Um, but if that math is a little bit confusing, it's okay. Uh, we like to use a color analogy to make a little bit more sense of this. So you can think of P and G as the common paint. Like we can both have, everyone can see there's yellow paint. That's fine. But then Alice will have her own secret paint, which is orange, which will be little a. Um, and Bob will have his own, which is little b, which is green. And then they'll combine those, come up with their own mixed colors, which can be public. So you could see that Alice will have big A being this peachish color. Given the peach color and yellow, it's still really hard. You can't extract orange out from this combined uh, paint. So that's the really the big idea of Diffie-Hellman key exchange. You're combining things which can't be extracted from each other again. So now they have a secret key. Now Alice and Bob can just pass notes through the class to each other without having to worry about other people understanding them, right? Well, unfortunately, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange isn't perfect. So Bob, unfortunately for Alice, was really their nosy classmate Eve all along. <laughs> I know, plot twist. Um, this could happen because uh, Alice did perform a perfect Diffie-Hellman key exchange, except because there's no way to prove that the exchanger is who they say they are in the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, Alice was actually performing this key exchange with Eve all along. So Eve had been going in between and changing the variables as they passed. So even though Alice was gave, or when Alice was trying to send her private key to Bob, Eve intercepted it and continued on and sent a different piece of paper to Bob saying, yeah, this is Alice's uh, secret, or not the sending the secret key, never send the secret key. When they were sending the public variables or the combined variables, she just passed on a note and was like, yeah, this is what Alice said, but it wasn't what Alice said. So she could stay in the middle and be the only one that's able to read and write to both of them because she made them have different secret keys because she changed the numbers right away or in the beginning, uh, if that makes sense. That can be a little bit confusing, but you can talk to me later if it doesn't make sense or, or just in general if you wanna talk. But this kind of attack is called the man in the middle attack where someone intercepts these messages and can either just eavesdrop, eavesdrop, listen in, um, or actually change what's happening. So it's broken, right? Like, how is it relevant? Why would you guys want to use it then? Well, in the real world, a modified version of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is still used in TLS and SSL. If you don't know what that is, just think, um, whenever you see a lock in the address bar, this could mean that a modified Diffie-Hellman uh, took place. So what kind of modifications am I talking about? Well, these modifications include adding a pre-shared public key that verifies that Alice and Bob are who they say they are. This solves the problem of Eve eavesdropping. So this was just um, a really basic introduction to the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Hopefully that made sense to you. Uh, if it didn't, feel free to reach out um, and talk to me or any of the other officers. I'm sure you'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, also, if you're just interested in this kind of, um, these exchanges and other kind of security topics like it, you can go to the White Hat uh, Cal Poly YouTube channel where there's a lot of other videos. Um, and there's some that cover actually like TLS and SSL, I believe, as well as uh, cryptography. Um, so yeah, this is just the beginning. Let your interest shine. If you didn't get anything else from this presentation, just remember that with the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, you can create a shared secret key from publicly shared variables and private variables combined. So that was it. Hopefully you guys feel like you got a little bit of something out of that talk. Um, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the lightning talks. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. All right. Next, we have Kedwin with an intro to Unix and Linux. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kedwin. And today, I'll be giving you all an introduction to Unix and Linux, hopefully. So let's begin. Um, here's what we'll be talking about, history of Unix and Linux. Uh, why do we care about uh, Linux still? Uh, and then maybe some time for questions. But yeah, let's get started. Um, I guess obligatory, who am I 
Uh, my name is Kedwin. I'm a fourth year computer engineering major. Uh, for White Hat, I'm the hardware outreach officer. And for Cal Poly Linux Users Group, I am the president. Sorry if you can hear that in the background. Um, if you want to know more about me, uh, there's, I have a website up. Uh, so let's not waste any more time. OK, so what is Unix? So oftentimes, um, in the computer science uh, community, we'll use Unix to describe a family of operating systems uh, that share a certain set of characteristics. What those characteristics are, um, I won't go into detail about, uh, about those for this talk, but I uh, know that uh, they all share kind of uh, similar traits. So Unix is it itself an operating system. Uh, it was created in 1969 at AT&T Bell Labs. It was a proprietary operating system. Um, and it, the license was such that anyone that received a copy of it could not modify that copy um, uh, for their own use. Uh, later on, it did gain multitasking and multi-user capabilities in the form of a time sharing system. So uh, previously, your operating system could only have one user doing one thing at one time. Uh, so this was a major uh, different uh, breakthrough um, and kind of uh, was why Unix became so popular. Um, like with any software, there's going to be multiple branches eventually. Um, and uh, AT&T did eventually license out a version of Unix called Research Unix. Um, and they shipped it out to all over the country. And people, um, even in military and all that, uh, government used uh, Unix, if I'm not mistaken. Um, here's the Unix family tree. Like I said, it did branch quite a bit. Uh, this is you, if you want to see the full size page, it is up on Wikipedia. So if that's what Unix, uh, Unix is, what's Linux? So one thing I didn't mention is that Unix did branch a few times, uh, to say the least. Um, two of the branches, uh, Minix is one important one, and BSD is another important one. So BSD came before uh, Linux development started, um, but that's the story of another day. Minix uh, was written by a professor um, in Sweden, I think. Couldn't quote me on that. Uh, as a Unix-like operating system for education use only, and so this is used in university. Uh, for students to learn programming and all the other uh, OS concepts like that. Uh, Linus Torvalds, a student at the time, uh, got frustrated with the license model of Minix, which says that you can only use it for education purposes. So he started writing his own kernel. Uh, eventually, he ended up writing a kernel that he started calling Freaks, but his, uh, one of his colleagues said, uh, yeah, uh, I'm just going to call it Unix, uh, Linux, and later asked for permission to call it Linux because Linus Torvalds didn't want it to be too egotistic. Uh, later on, Linus Torvalds did agree to it. But anyway, I'm getting off track. Uh, the kernel, uh, Linux, is the core part of an operating system called the kernel. The kernel often handles um, interaction with the hardware and other uh, such tasks that the programs that user space writes, which is anything that is not the operating system, uh, doesn't want to deal with. So anything like networking, opening, closing files, um, making a fork of a process, to uh, making a fork of itself, sorry, running other processes, stuff like that. So all the low level um, interaction with the hardware and other stuff, the kernel handles that. So that's why it's not off always the correct term technically isn't Linux, it's GNU Linux or Linux distribution, which is basically Linux kernel plus a bunch of other software uh, that's Jesus, I'm sorry, guys, if you can hear any of the, the background noise. Um, is uh, Linux distribution of software and other, other tools. Next. So yeah, like uh, Unix, uh, Linux also branched off a bunch of times. Um, yeah, this is also another thing that's on Wikipedia. Don't try to read this. It's, you're not going to have a good day. Uh, but yeah, Unix, Linux is a very, very uh, popular and a, very, a lot of variations. So why do we care? Um, well, I'm going to make the claim that Linux runs the world. And I will have some numbers to back me up. So uh, first thing, the top 500 supercomputers uh, as measured in you know, floating operation point, uh, point, uh, per second, which is just a benchmark, uh, all the top 500 runs uh, run Linux. And then in 20, as of 2015, 98.1% uh, of top 1 million sites on the public internet do run a form of Linux as a web server. Uh, note that this doesn't cover any of the internal servers in organizations that may run Microsoft Windows because um, I do know that's a popular uh, deployment type. And then these next numbers are from Stack Overflow about the 55% of developers, 26% of developers, 70% of uh, public servers, whatever. Uh, actually, the 70% is from Red Hat. Um, 
but yeah, as you can see, it's, it's, it is a non-trivial, um, it's uh, a class of operating systems that has a non-trivial market share. So uh, in case the liberalism worry thing, uh, here's a few more things that you can do with Linux. Um, uh, a few operating systems that you might recognize. Um, BSD is kind of important because Mac OS. Mac OS is a, uh, is part of, it, it has its roots in uh, a fork of BSD called Darwin. And Darwin is released, is developed uh, by Apple, for Apple. Uh, I haven't found the code for it. There's a, there are sometimes uh, open source versions of it, but I don't claim to know any of them. Anyway, so, but why do we really care? Like I just showed you some common use cases that we see in the world. Um, but kind of going back to that slide, you are probably running a Unix-like operating system, it, unless you're running Windows. In that case, well, you're not. Um, programming. Um, a lot of the concepts we use in the classes we develop, we, uh, we that Kapoli teaches, uh, do use concepts that you can really find readily in Unix and Linux. So if you are fluent and you understand Linux, Unix Linux very well, you will likely have a better time uh, in the programming classes. And as far as the uh, code that you write for those classes, it's probably created on a, on a Unix server. Uh, that's in the CS department, um, but I'm not sure if they're still doing that this, uh, this year with COVID and all that. Um, as far as performance for Unix and Linux, well, it wouldn't be a non-trivial uh, class of operating systems if it wasn't performant. So it does, you can quote unquote revive old hardware as in, because the, bent, the overhead for Linux is generally lower. Uh, you can, on a really old system, you could probably run a Linux distribution uh, if you can't run the latest uh, Windows or other operating system software. And lastly, security, because it's always an afterthought. Um, Linux tends to be, I say tends to be more secure uh, than most other operating systems, but it is also very possible, because you, uh, Linux is so flexible, you can also make it super, super insecure. Uh, and there are projects dedicated to this, such as Metasploitable, um, which are just chock full of vulnerabilities intended for security research and uh, learning about um, uh, penetration testing. So those are a few things I said. Now, if you want to get started with a Linux-based operating system, here's a map that I found on Reddit. It's actually a pretty good one. Um, yeah, uh, I can provide the link for it later if you're interested. Um, and then kind of a shameless plug, at the very beginning, I did mention I was the acting president for Capoli Linux Users Group. So if you want to join that group, uh, we can provide uh, help if you would like to get started and but don't know where. Uh, here's the contact information. And before I get accused for sh not being part of uh, White Hat, I will turn it over back to Steven. Thank you, Kedwin. Uh, yeah, Cplug is a cool club. You should go check them out. Uh, all right, our third talk, uh, we have John Prentice on an intro to networks. Indeed. All right. So yes, welcome. I'm John. I'm going over an intro to, an intro to networks. I'm the systems administrator. Um, so let's get started. All right, so starting things off, we'll begin at my computer. I have, I have this example IP address of 192.168.1.10. Wait, I should probably introduce myself first though, so let's go to there. Um, <clears throat> so who am I? I'm a fourth year computer science student, um, the sysadmin, as I mentioned before, for White Hat. I'm also the malware tech team lead, which you heard earlier. We're back for this quarter. Um, so if you're interested in malware, uh, contact me on that. And also networks are complex and cool. And if you like networks, I recommend taking CP464, which is intro to networks. And PFSense is a great firewall. So, okay, back to where we were. So what is an IP address? Basically an IP address is a grouping of binary ones and zeros that when grouped into sets of eight bits form octets, which then form the IP address that you see, 192.168.1.10. But how does that go to the internet? Like, how do we connect out to the rest of the world? Well, this IP address also comes with it a subnet, which for this use case, we'll have a slash 24 subnet. 
and then a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. Now that seems probably pretty confusing. Those two are basically exactly the same for all intents and purposes, but slash 24 is important because it can tell us what other computers are in our local area network or LAN, and also how we can access our router. But before we get to a router, I'm on a laptop. So how do I get to the router, which probably is plugged in somewhere? Well, we got to use some Wi-Fi. And no, Wi-Fi is not like the router itself. Most routers include a Wi-Fi access point, which that's what I'm, what I'm talking about here. In this case, we'll be connecting to a secure Wi-Fi network, preferably connect or secured with WPA3 or WPA2 maybe. Um, but yeah, with a passcode on it, once you connect to that, you're, you're secure, mostly. Um, your connection at least to your router is secured from other random people joining to your network, but the data itself may not be secure. Um, but yeah, so that's going from my laptop to now Wi-Fi. All right. So now we're at Wi-Fi. Where do we go from there? Well, if you have a router that looks something like this, or if you've seen this common blue Linksys branded router pretty much, um, those include the access point built into it. That's what the two antenna in the back are. Um, and in this case, we'll say that the router's IP address is 192.168.1.1. That's important because if you remember that subnet mask, mask I was talking about, that starts at dot zero slash 24. Slash 24 is a common enough subnet that basically indicates that we can go from one to 255 as the final numbers at the end of that last period for all available IP addresses. And by default, one is the router, the router's IP address. So that's how my, my laptop is able to know where the router is. And that's important because while I know where the router is, currently I have no idea how to actually send information to that router. There is a nice process though. Oh yes, this is all within the local area network, which is called our LAN. The nice process to be able to send information from my laptop to the router, such as going to google.com or going to Zoom, um, is using ARP. So before I know how to actually send any information to my router, my laptop needs to ARP for my default gateway, in other words, the router, and that gives me back the MAC address of the router. And the MAC address is important because at the purely like hardware level, or close enough to hardware level, um, computers op and different machines operate by sending packets, which is the raw data from the internet, um, to MAC addresses, not to IP addresses. So we have to translate the IP address 192.168.1.1 into some sort of MAC address that is my router. So once we've done that, we've sent the packet, the router now has my information going like, I wanna to go to google.com or Zoom. And now we gotta to go to my internet service provider. So in this case, as is also the case for most everyone here in SLO who is off campus, it's probably Spectrum. Um, so Spectrum also assigns my router an IP address, but this one is different than the LAN IP address. This is the WAN IP address or wide area network. Basically what that means is now my router can know where its router, in other words, the ISP, how, how my router is able to connect to that in order to send my pending uh, connection to google.com to Spectrum. Routers also usually have built-in firewalls, so anyone within Spectrum and the greater internet are not able to connect back into my laptop. Um, but this is kind of the rough, rough estimate of how you, your router is connected to Spectrum or whoever your ISP is. And usually that's over a coax cable or sometimes even fiber if you're in a very nice area like that. Um, additionally also, Spectrum is both an ISP and also an autonomous system. And autonomous, autonomous systems are important because they're the next highest level of grouping of internet service providers and access across the internet. 
In this case also, autonomous systems are identified by their ASN number, which Spectrums is 7843, and that'll be important for the next, next bit of information. So, all right, so we got Spectrum, we got its ASN, we know now Spectrum has our packet. We're going from Spectrum to somewhere across the internet. Well, we first have to send that packet through all of Spectrum's data centers to Spectrum's peering point or edge node. That's important because to communicate across the internet, most autonomous systems are connected in a, in a form of a network called BGP that communicates over BGP. And while BGP is pretty technical and we won't get into for this talk. Um, for that, I recommend taking Networks 464 um, or CP 464, which is Intro to Networks. Um, but BGP basically allows autonomous systems to synchronize with other autonomous systems who their neighbors are. And a neighbor in this, in this case is just where their peering point is physically connected to. So basically Spectrum has other neighbors who its peering point is connected to physically, and then those have neighbors off of them. And that's how pretty much all of the autonomous systems tend to communicate, um, at least within the same country. And then when to go to other countries, it's even larger and larger scope after that. Um, and there may be multiple peering points because Spectrum may have even more neighbors across from it, but all of the autonomous systems know who is in communication with who through BGP and synchronization from that. And that is important to be able to know where to send my packet, which is in this case, going to Zoom, everyone's favorite. Um, so we got a packet to Zoom coming from my laptop, connected over Wi-Fi, going to the router, going to Spectrum, then Spectrum takes that packet and it's like, ah, where do I go from here? Well, I gotta go to Zoom. So I'll send it across BGP through the internet um, across all the waves of BGP. And finally, we'll get to Zoom with its autonomous system number. Kind of represents something sort of like this um, with the internet kind of sharing the communication between Spectrum and Zoom and other autonomous systems like that. Um, but that's, yeah, we'll ignore that. Um, so how did we actually know to get all the way to this autonomous system for Zoom? All we had is calpoly.zoom.us. That's just some random like domain name or website name. It's actually like subdomains and domains, but that's all gonna be next week's talk. Um, so definitely come attend that if you're interested in hearing more about that. But basically that domain in essence points to Zoom's peering point or some sort of public facing server that Zoom owns and connects that to Cal Poly. So cool. Once we send a packet, that goes into Zoom's whole network, which presumably is just a bunch of data centers and extra servers, probably all running on AWS because everything's on AWS at this point. Um, and that does all the video processing, the audio processing, and then basically takes all of my data, gets it ready to be sent over to you, the audience. Now, if you're a freshman living on campus, how does that get over to you or anyone living on campus for that matter? Well, next we go to Scenic. Scenic is unique. Scenic is the organization that pretty much connects all of the California research institutions and colleges all together so then they can have very fast intercommunication between each other. Um, and then from there, that's connected to other autonomous systems. In this case, Scenic has a direct line of access to Zoom, presumably, and also to Spectrum. Um, even to AWS, so that would be even faster. Um, and so the packet goes straight from Zoom directly to Scenic and then down the pipeline to you at Cal Poly. So to get into Cal Poly, it likely is gonna hit Cal Poly's public facing firewall, which if any of you have yet delved into connecting to the Cal Poly Unix servers, you know you gotta connect to a, a VPN in order to get access into campus. Um, but that's because of the firewall. So, but for traffic that's web-based traffic, it just goes straight through the firewall. It goes into Cal Poly's various servers, connecting to 
internet-based routing and everything related to that. From there, we get to the ResNet, which would, is likely who's providing you internet within the dorms or PCV or wherever. And then straight to you on your laptop. And that's how you're able to see this presentation. Um, simple as that. There's a lot of complex uh, systems all going through it, but in essence, we're just sending a packet from me across this wave of the internet and BGP and Zoom straight to you. Does anyone have any questions? All right. All right, uh, yeah. If there, are, if there are no questions, then we will be moving on to the last talk of the night, uh, which is me. Uh, <laughs> And now I have to deal with sharing my screen. All right. So, yes, uh, my name is Stephen Parkinson. Uh, I am the president of White Hat. And uh, my talk tonight is, what is White Hat? Uh, but first, we're going to talk about who am I. Uh, I am a fourth year software engineering major. Uh, like I said, I'm the president of White Hat. Uh, I also love Apple. Uh, and as my meme text says, uh, I was thoroughly underwhelmed by yesterday's Apple event. Um, I knew they weren't going to announce phones, but I was still disappointed that they didn't. So anyway, back to the topic at hand. What is White Hat? Uh, in essence, White Hat is a computer security education club. We learn about how to help protect people or help people protect their stuff. Uh, a lot of the times that can be from themselves. Uh, there's a lot of social engineering and things like that. And that's a lot, that's where a lot of um, threats in current times come from. Your presentation has frozen. Cool. I thought that might be a problem because it froze yesterday. Um, is oh. it going now? It is now, yes. Yay, okay. Did we miss? We missed your. We who missed am I. my. Who am I? There we go. There's the who am I. Uh, yeah. Anyway, that's not important. Um, this is the important part. Is it still working? <laughs> Good. Okay. It is. Uh, anyway, yeah. So, in essence, White Hat is a security uh, computer security education club. Um, we cover a lot of different topics in our talks. Uh, as you can see from tonight, we had three very different topics um, and then mine, which is somewhat unique and less related to security than the other ones. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so I've honestly just gained a bunch of general knowledge from being in White Hat. Um, a lot of dif different hardware and software stuff that I didn't know before. Uh, so yeah, what do we do then? Um, White Hat is hacking, education, and it's, it's a social and fun club. So, well, first of all, uh, hacking. Ethically, of course, we, we're, not, we're not bad people. <laughs> we, <laughs> we always want to act in ethical ways and what ethical hacking really means is if you are doing like a penetration test on a company or something like that, and you already have authorization uh, to be in their systems and things like that, you have the permission to do that. Uh, or with like something like if someone were to discover an iOS vulnerability, uh, going through the process of responsible disclosure to Apple rather than just releasing it to the wider internet uh, so that it could, or I guess, yeah, so that it could be exploited and potentially harm people. Um, yeah, and one of the ways that I've gotten some like real experience with this kind of hacking and things like that is through the CTFs. They are a great way to learn new skills that you might not have the chance to uh, in classes, uh, although our uh, offering of security classes has definitely gotten a lot stronger uh, in recent years, so that's it's improving. Uh, yeah, so then education. Um, 
Obviously, we have our weekly talks, as all of you know, because you are here. Thank you for coming. Um, we also have a couple tech teams. Uh, we're working on getting some more started. Uh, as John was talking about earlier, we have the malware tech team. Uh, we did some pretty fun stuff uh, in winter last year, um, setting up uh, Windows VM and isolating it and making sure that what we were running wasn't getting onto uh, our host system. Uh, we also, um, Natasha is starting a lock picking uh, tech team. So be on the lookout for more information on that because lock picking is very fun. Uh, also be aware that if you're not in California, the laws may be different. So look into your local laws when you're looking into lock picking. Um, and then fun. We have a lot of social events. Uh, we do a lot of fun stuff. Uh, like board game nights. Uh, we had one virtually on last Friday. I, it was, it was great. Uh, we'll have more during the quarter. So also be on the lookout for those. Um, yeah, we also get to take fun pictures of people when they look silly and then use them as memes. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a good time. Uh, we also will be having a movie night this quarter. Uh, so also be on the lookout for information about how we're doing that because that's some fun logistics. Um, yeah, so the lab. Um, for those of you who were around last year, uh, you might know that we have a lab space on campus uh, in the Bonderson building. Uh, however, obviously, we do not have access to it right now. Uh, so we are going to try to take the lab virtual. Uh, we have set up a channel in the uh, Discord, the White Hat Discord, um, which if you are not a part of yet, there's a link to join on our website and in the Slack. Uh, so yeah, we have a channel in there that's just the lab. Uh, and anyone is welcome anytime to come hang out uh, there. Will probably be an officer around who is, and all of the officers are more than willing to answer any questions you have uh, or chat with you about any security topic that you're interested in. Uh, they're all really nice people and really interested in security. So, yeah. Um, and I clicked on a different window, so I don't have control anymore. Uh, and then, yeah, also just friends. Uh, <laughs> John stole my picture, but that's, yeah, I, I like that picture of me holding the umbrella a lot. Um, yeah, so it's just a nice way to meet people. Uh, I've met a lot of people through White Hat and I hope that you will as well. Uh, with that, welcome. Uh, yeah, stop by the Slack and the Discord and just chat with us.